cool. So Kelly, it's been a while since we've uh, since we've had a chat. Last time I spoke to you actually was at the Hall of Fame. Um, oh yeah. It, in a roundabout way, do you think you'll wind up with a plaque in there? I don't know. You know, th that's a good question. Um, it's kind of up in the air. I mean, I see some people that got in, and I'm kind of like questioning how, and then you see some that should be in that's not in. Um, you know, the big thing with that is if I get in, I get in. Um, it, it would be cool as hell, don't get me wrong, but <clears throat> I still had a, a great accomplishment in my career, so I'm, I'm content no matter which way it goes. Um, just going back to the start, Kelly, I saw that you were brought up in a Slovakian neighborhood. Is that where the, is that the Pavlik name? Is that Slovakian? Yes. Yes, it is. So got a mixture of all kinds of things, but yeah, it's, uh, it's called Lansingville. It was, um, on the city's, uh, South side and, uh, you know, nice community. Uh, well, it was a nice community. Um, but you know, yeah, that's where I grew up. So Pavlik, Slovak last name. Were your parents from America or did they come from Slovakia? No. So I'm, I'm a mixture of everything. You know, my, um, my dad's grandmother came from uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, his grandmother on the other side came from Sicily. And then um, on my mom's side, you know, we had uh, German and, and Welsh and things like that. So my dad's actually right down the middle, um, Sicilian and Slovak. And then my mom, you know, has a mixture. So. I kind of got got everybody, uh, all, all kinds of different stuff in my my blood. And your dad sold insurance, right? He, he worked at worked at a steel mill for a lot of years. Um, was in the navy. He was a jet mechanic in the navy when he came out of uh, high school, and then he went to the insurance business. Poof, I would say probably about ninety three, ninety four. So were there still closures in Youngstown? Is that is that what I'm thinking? When when big industry started to close down, was he a victim of that? Yeah, yeah, everything went. You know, it was bad, and, and uh, you know, it's even worse now, unfortunately. But yeah, steel mills shut down. People were forced to, you know, a lot of people moved out of the, out of the area. A lot of people were jobless. A lot of you know, so it, it was tough. It was a tough time because, you know, you got to look at it this way especially for somebody like my dad. I mean, I was young. When that all happened, I was a baby. And, and most of it happened before I was even born. Um, but, you know, a lot of these people came out, they were dependent. You know, they came out of high school and they had great jobs. They were going to steel mill and it was job security was big. And then all of a sudden after that, you know, there was nothing really in the city uh, when they all shut down. So did you have hardship growing up? Was it Were, were your parents short of money and that kind of stuff? Yeah, but, you know, the one thing I got to give credit to is my parents always made sure we had, you know what I mean? Um, I'm not saying that, you know, we got everything we wanted. It wasn't that way. You know, we were city kids and, and uh, blue collar, but, you know, we, we didn't go without either. So, you know, you, you actually, you learn to, I think that's where I'm at today, you know, especially with my dad being there as part of my team. Um, you, you know, you learn what you work for, hard work and, and you do the right things with that, you know, you make it last. And, and uh, that was a big part. And, and with me being able to stay retired for almost a decade now and being able to, you know, do the investments and everything else I got going. So uh, I, I give that tip my hat to my dad on that one and my mom. I mean, you can't tip your hat too much because there was talk of a comeback about four years ago, right? You were, you were flowing with it, even at a higher weight class. Yeah, that was... Um, that was the Joe Rogan show, man. So <laughs> what did Joe get you, you know, high? Did Joe get you high and get you thinking about being a champ again? No, that, that was all, you know, um, some of it wasn't bold. Like I had a little bit of the itch, but that was kind of the game plan, you know, going in on that one. Um, just to see what the buzz would be, you know, it was out of curiosity. Um, again, it wasn't all fully joke, but I mean, if you were to ask me two days before I went on the show, you know, I would tell you, no, nah. but yeah, it was more, it was more fun. You know, you got, you got to look at the platform that it was on. So. Sure. So you were testing the waters to see what was out there yeah. a little bit. Um, what took you to boxing, by the way, age, age nine, did your, did your dad do it at all? Or was it just something you wanted to try for yourself? So I wanted to try, actually, you know, I was involved in sports and, and at that time, you know, um, you had movies out and a lot of the karate movies were big, the karate kids and, and all these other different ones. And as all kids, you know, I ran around the house throwing kicks and stuff like that. Um, my brother's box, but nothing serious. You know, they went to the gym and, 
and uh, they liked it, but they they weren't there to fight. But I kept, you know, I was the youngest of three, so I would just keep tugging away on my parents to let me go, and they didn't want me fighting. And then finally, you know, right about 10, almost 11 years old, they finally took me to the gym, you know, to, to get me in there and, and let me see it. And I'll never forget, you know, I, I sparred the first time I sparred, I got my, my butt whipped and um, they were happy because they thought I was going to quit. You know, they thought I was done. And I'll never forget, I came home from school the next day and, and I went to my bedroom and started packing my gym bag. And uh, my dad come, goes, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going back to the gym to kick that kid's ass. And they just put their head down like, oh, no. But um, that's kind of how I got into it. You know, I just I truly fell in love with the sport, the the one on one aspect of it and everything else. When was the first time you realized you could you could punch like a mule? Oh, man, that came. That came right about uh, at 16, you know, almost 17. It was a tournament. It was overnight. Um, I went to a tournament, a big one under 19 uh, national championships and. I was fighting pretty good opponents and I was just dropping them and, and stopping guys. Um, and it really was, it was like a um, light switch, you know, just turned on overnight and it was surprising. And then we really started to notice it in sparring. And now I would spar people and um, you hit them and they would, they would stop and turn and lean over the rope or some of them would, would go down to the, uh, the canvas. So yeah, it really was surprising when it, it just all came to be. What was it? Was it technique you've been working on? Was it strength training that you've been doing, or was it, um, or, or were you just getting your man strength? I think a little bit of everything. Um, so just like in baseball, you know, you always hear about, you know, the the old saying, um, either you got it in the cradle or you don't. You know, so a lot of times it, it is just natural like home run hitters in baseball you know if you're a leadoff hitter you're probably never going to become a, a home run hitter you know because a lot of technique and everything comes into it leverage um do me personally now that i've been involved with strength training and owning gyms and, and stuff like that do i think you could add some some power on uh yeah do i think it'll make you a knockout puncher overnight if you're not no um but i think a big part of it almost with a lot of these athletes or a lot of these fighters would be you would have to almost start them over from ground zero, you know, and kind of like reform their entire technique uh, because power punches come from, from a certain leverage and how you, and, and torque and how you throw the punch. And uh, I think mine was just a, a mixture of all of it. I think um, getting my man strength at that age and having the, the style that I had in the punch leverage, I think that was a big part of it. It's interesting. I ask you this because you've mentioned that your background in lifting there. So I know that you've been around the gyms in retirement from, from boxing and stuff. What about PEDs? Could that make you a knock? Can they make you a knockout puncher? Uh, no, uh, it'll give you some power, just like with anything, um, you know, PEDs. And I'll use this one. And I know a lot of people in the, the lifting community won't be too happy about this, but I don't give a shit because I'm against it, you know, but the, the shit does help, though. OK, PEDs help and, and people take them for a lot of different reasons. You had numerous people throughout sports take them. And sometimes it wasn't to, to hit 95 home runs or throw 120 miles an hour, but it was for longevity, you know, um, not being injury prone. Uh, hand eye coordination, believe it or not, it does help with your uh, reaction time and stuff like that. Um, you've seen guys like Barry Bonds and Mark McGuire in baseball. Them guys play, yeah, were they home run hitters? Yeah, okay, but they, then they play all them years in their baseball career, and, and then all of a sudden, the last couple of years, they look like defensive ends for an NFL football team, and they're putting 72 home runs out at 40, 39, 40 years old. Um, so when people tell me that the shit ain't cheating, they go fly a kite. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but no, PEDs will help with, with punching again on that part of it. It'll help, but I think PEDs, uh, PEDs will help on many more things um, and have more of a benefit for other issues in boxing other than power, unless you're a power guy, just like in baseball. Barry, it helped Barry Bonds and McGuire because they were already home run type guys. You know what I mean? So um, in boxing, I think it's the same. Sure. So you're saying it accentuated the skill sets they already had? Everything. 
yeah, you know. reaction time helps you lose weight faster, helps you, which is a big part of it. You know, um, a lot of people say like, you know, there are some issues and I'm not knocking the guy. I think he's a great fighter, but a lot of people talk about like diuretics and, and shit like that. Listen, in boxing, the biggest thing that everybody knows or fighters know is the skill, the weight skill and, and training camp and, and how much you're dehydrating yourself throughout camp, how weak, you know, a, a lot of boxing camps, I would say majority the biggest thing is strategy, you know, who could not, who, who could go the longest without having to dry out, you know, to make weight, they're going to have the, the edge, right? Um, but when you're on these, these PEDs, you know, it's a natural, it's an automatic diuretic. And if you could go through training camp without having to kill yourself or starve yourself and, and come fight night, you're, you're ready to go full um, 99%. That's kind of cheating, you know, while the other sure. guys naturally drying out and having to make weight throughout the two months of training camp um it's it just every every aspect of it is a benefit so back in the day the early days you had an early encounter with harry arroyo uh, early in your boxing career and you trained at his south side gym or the south side gym where he trained right yeah it was uh jack lowe's gym but uh, going back to the first day that i went to the gym that's you know i don't know if you call it destiny or, or what you would call it but when I walked in the gym, Jack wasn't there. And my mom took me there. And uh, the only person in the gym was Harry Arroyo. And at that time, I, I didn't know boxing. You know what I mean? I didn't know who, who was who. And uh, she goes, uh, we, we leave. Oh, man. Hold on. I'm sorry. I had a call. Okay. Um, so, so we leave and uh, we get to the car and my mom goes, do you know who that was? And I, and I go, no. She goes, that was the IBF lightweight champion of the world, Harry Arroyo. And it was just kind of a coincidence and, and everything else, you know, to meet him. Because Harry wasn't in the gym all the time. Harry, at that point, Harry was already pretty well removed from the sport. But um, Harry would go to all the different gyms in the area and just train, you know. And that day he happened to be at the, the Southside Boxing Gym. Did you like it from the start, the South Side, or, or just in the gym in general? You know the familiar smell, the sounds, the atmosphere of a boxing gym. Was it? Were you hooked? Yeah, um, you know, I took martial. As I was saying, I, it was hard. You know, I'm, I kind of bounced around a little bit on the previous question when you asked about how I got into it. But um, you know, a lot of it, I did go to take martial arts and stuff like that. Not knocking martial arts, I think is fantastic for certain certain people. Um, and I think certain martial arts are really really good uh, good like jujitsu and and uh muay thai but um for me it just you know like the standard martial arts wasn't doing it you know the karate or taekwondo and and uh it wasn't enough activity for me and when my parents when my parents finally let me go to the gym that that was the defining moment and uh you know there was just a lot of things of sparring um like i said when i got whooped you know i came back into it and and uh, I liked it, but the other stuff I, I never really got into. So I, I knew boxing was was huge. And those old school disciplines have kind of been uh, not made a mockery of, but they've been found out by the UFC and stuff, haven't they? So they would sort of, you know, if it was it had been found out by then that those things didn't work in real fights and stuff. Yeah, there's a lot, you know, a lot of a lot of old stuff, but there's a lot to, that goes against that too as well. So I mean, it all depends. Sure. Uh, your main successes in the amateurs came at welterweight, I believe. So now you're a national power champion, junior golden gloves champion, a national under 19 champ. And then you fought a guy called Jermaine Taylor in the Olympic trials, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? That was a good fight. I actually, I, I got, no, I fought Darnell Wilson again. So the, the story with Darnell Wilson, which is a, a pretty big one, is Darno at the time when I I beat him just a couple months earlier, maybe two months earlier, I fought him in the uh, U.S. Championships. And Darno Wilson was going for the record in amateur boxing for the five straight U.S. National Championships. Um, he was a phenomenal guy. He was older. I was 17. He was 29 or 30. Um, talk about a difference right there on top of that. Nobody gave me a chance at hell to win. Um, not because I wasn't good, but that was my, like my second open tournament that I was in coming out of the junior Olympics. So I, I was a baby, I was fresh. And, uh, this guy is going for his record breaking, uh, national championship. So they had three rings set up in the arena and, uh, everybody on, um, 
people and the fans sit in the stands and and they watch the the fights and nobody was by that by that ring because everybody thought Darnell Wilson was going to walk through me and you know everybody would watch Darnell Wilson on the championship night on Friday or Saturday so after the first round you see a little bit of people start moving down towards the first ring after the second round you see a handful more people and by the last round Everybody in the, that arena was sitting by ring one where I was fighting uh, Darno, and I beat him 26-12. I mean, I, I spanked him. And then I had him, he already had qualified through other national tournaments, so I had to fight him in the Olympic trials and uh, the first night again. And it was a little tougher that time, you know. I still beat him, and and Darno was great. He, I mean, he, he's a Hall of Famer in amateur boxing. And then I fought Jermaine the second night. Um, Jermaine was a good fight. First round, he hit me with a body shot. I swear I felt my spleen go through my butthole. Um, I couldn't breathe. <laughs> and uh, he got me. And then the, the second and third round, I made it a fight. I mean, it was actually a good fight. He won. You know, I'm not going to say that I got robbed in that one. But, uh, you know, I think that made a big difference. Not so much the fight itself, because amateur boxing is night and day from, from professional boxing. And I think the only people who would ever say that amateur boxing that you could take a good amount of amateur boxing into the pros for people who never had a pro career but had a good amateur career and are living off that it's two different ball games so you know a lot of people were comparing it and they're like oh he's grown now but up here i knew i knew i could take his his power his punches that's the only thing you could gain from the amateurs um but i was just confident with my overall conditioning and everything else going into the uh, pros and fighting him with the man maturity now, me being 25 years old and having that makes a big, bigger difference. Did you think your paths would cross again? Uh, I, I would say that became realistic in, in 2005. Yeah, I did so, that at the beginning. Sure, sure. And then um, also, I, I had a question. Did you box at the Ohio State Fair? Did you ever fight there? I sure did one time. And I fought... Um, Early on, I got I got beat by another great um, Tiger Allen, Tiger Allen and Rock Allen. Their dad was Nazim Richardson, who trained you know Bernard Hopkins. They were out of Philadelphia, um, phenomenal amateurs. They have numerous national titles, and I even think uh, world titles. But yeah, I drew uh, Tiger Allen in, in the Ohio State Fair, and man, he uh, he could fight. Um, tell me about your relationship with Jack Lowe back then, sort of as, as you grew up and sort of learned more about boxing. How close did you guys become? Oh, you came close. You know, it was a, a little team. Again, my dad, you know, um, Jack, me, and we had a couple other guys. You know, um, we had a guy by the name of Tank DeCicio who was, you know, around and uh, very, at that time, very experienced um, with some parts of the fight game. Um we were close you know jack was was there and, and again i played sports and jack was uh, very patient too because there was a lot of times that there would be big tournaments that i missed so going into it making no excuses by any means but like when i fought tiger allen at that time i was 15 14 or 15 i had probably uh 10 amateur fights at that time because i took breaks you know i would play when football season was going i was playing you know, Pee Wee football. I played baseball just about up to 17 years old. Um, and I, I would try out with like basketball and do that. So it all kind of hurt each other. You know, um, I could excel, I think, on a lot of the sports, but I never had the time to put into them because when I was done with one, I was going to the next. You know, and there was never no practice or, or do anything. And I say right around 15 was like, when I really, really got serious with boxing and that became, you know, my number one sport. Did you look you know, up Jack, to Jack was cool. To all that. You know, I'm sorry. Jack was cool. You know, he, he, he was like, go ahead, you know, go, go do that. Be a kid pretty much. And that's, that's the way I kind of am now with some of the people I work with or some of the, um, you know, uh, consulting that I do with some of the uh, parents. I'm like, let them be kids, you know, um, go out. So, yeah, it was cool like that. And, and uh, the bond, you know, that we had, you know, carried throughout. Were there fighters that you looked up to as a kid? Not really. Um, I did and I didn't. So it's weird. Um, I, I was just a big fan of the sport overall. You know what I mean? Um, I don't know if you remember back in the day, but like KO Digest used to have like the, 
posters inside the magazines and you know you go a lot of, i'll go over like another kid's house that was a boxer and you would see like a picture of one of the guys on the wall i never idolized or had like a, a role model um i think i was just a student and i observed every person i watched I and mean, i did like watching de la jolla i liked watching Gotti. i like watching some of the old fights with sugar ray leonard and uh, Pernell Whitaker, and I got into those, uh, but I wasn't like a, a fanboy. And again, I just watched and I studied certain things that they did and things that worked for them. And I would even do that with certain guys in the gym. You know, we had a couple pros that were six years older than me, and uh, yeah, Craig Kickta and, and a guy by the name of Kenny Signorani. And I would watch them and see what they did. You know, I was always learning and observing. We've done this show with uh, Ray Boom Boom Mancini, who um, put in a bit of color and descriptions about Youngstown, Youngstown and what it was like for him growing up, obviously, a, f a few generations before you or a generation or, or two before you. And he was telling me about the Youngstown tune ups and, uh, you know, the mob, mob life and gang life because because of where Youngstown is geographically between the groups in uh, was it was Pittsburgh and Cleveland. And and Pittsburgh, so Cleveland, New York. New York, Chicago, you're right in the middle. Um, yeah, you, you were. Were you exposed to any gang life? Was that ever an option for you? Or was that something that you were attracted to? No, that started petering out. And again, you know, on that, it's kind of funny. You know, a lot of a lot of the um, Italian Sicilians kind of pulled away from that too, believe it or not. You know, like a lot of the families in Youngstown didn't want to, didn't want to talk about it. For instance... I was real close on my grandmother's side who were uh, full-blooded Sicilian and her, you know, parents came from Sicily and she would never talk about that in the house. She never really brought up, you know, we, we liked mafia movies, but she never got into it. And when we would stay over there, you know, you weren't watching uh, certain movies. Uh, they, they frowned upon it. Um, but when I was younger, yeah, it was still, it was still um, in Youngstown. It wasn't as, it wasn't in its prime like it was in the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. And um, and again, that all has to do with because you had the steel mills. That's the that's the biggest thing. There was there was stuff in Youngstown, Ohio, for crime families to be involved with. There was money. There was a lot. Now, what what, what would they want to get? What, what do they have to get out of Youngstown? There's nothing here. You know what I mean? Um, so, and as I was growing up, it was kind of the same thing. You know, there was no real need to be a crime family or how, how be an organized crime member in Youngstown, Ohio. You know, what was you going to make money on? <laughs> with, you know? all, with all due respect, this will shock a few people, but you left school with qualifications in computer graphics, right? I did. Was that going to be the future? Was that ever the plan? Or is that, is that your future now? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so it was a, it's a, I went to a joint vocational school, like a, a trade school. And, uh, and a lot of kids went there, you know, because at the time, I'm not going to lie, a lot of kids were coming out with good jobs, you know, and uh, graphic arts. Yeah, I like doing it. But it, it, boxing, 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 that was all. I was sitting... Um, study hall and everybody would be doing the homework and i was reading the usa boxing magazine amateur you know reading ring magazine all these different things and uh getting hollered at all the time so one time the teacher finally told me after a couple semesters she was like don't bring no more boxing stuff in here you know and uh that's where my mind was at you know i, I think the smart thing about it was i put my mind to something that i truly loved and made it passionate about and was able to succeed at it. I was realistic, like I'm the one that I'm going to make be successful in, you know, and it's going to make me a career in the future. Um, as of right now, you know, the graphic arts, no, I, mean, I got way too much going on. <laughs> hey, so, um, so your plan was this then to turn professional and be the world middleweight champion. That was the yes. plan. That was, that was, that was my life. Um, you know, in a weird way, um, maybe I think different than other people. At first, when I turned pro, everything was when the fight, be, you know, that per, one fight at a time, beat the person in front of you. But being being human and just naturally, as you're knocking everybody out and winning and you're signed by one of the biggest promotional companies in boxing, I would say right around 2003, 2004, it started becoming reality. Like, 
dude, you're fucking in, like, in a position right now to eventually be ranked in the top 15 in the world in the pros, you're undefeated, and eventually fight for a title. And I, I would definitely say right around 2004 was when I, I started making that to career. And it was a real factor because I turned right back around in 2005 and fought for the NABF you know, title. And the NABF at that time in 2005 was, was a, a big belt still, you know, like you won the NABF, you're a contender, you're, you're in a run. So it was huge. So you turned pro in June 2000 and you won eight on the bounce before stopping future contender champ Grady Brewer in two rounds. That's a win that's aged really well, given what Grady went on to achieve, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, and there was a lot of them. There was a lot of them in my career that uh, people don't realize, but Grady Brewer was just another one of them. Um, hell, my pro debut, uh, my agent really didn't, who was probably the best manager of all time, Cameron Duncan, he didn't want that fight with my the guy I fought my pro debut. You know, he was trained by uh, Goosen, I believe. Um, you know, he, he was a short, stocky, looked like Mike Tyson could hit. And it was just a dangerous fight to put a, a young eight to – yeah, 18 year old. I just turned 18 at that time, you know, to put in the ring. But uh, Grady Burr was another guy, you know, that, yeah, he went on right at, shortly after he won this, the second season of Contender and uh, he was he was a game fighter. In 2005, you started switching gears. You beat Zuniga in a big win and then things started to really happen. As you say, really, you became the first man to stop Bronco McCart, who was a real handful. Uh, what do you recall about fighting Bronco? Oh, Bronco's a, first of all, he's a tremendous person and he's a cool dude. Um, but Bronco was, it was hard to, to fight Bronco because at that time, um, there used to be Tuesday night fights on USA Network and uh, Bronco was always fighting on that. He was fighting Winky Wright and all them guys. And I was a fan of Bronco. So when they announced that fight, it was kind of hard, you know, uh, to fight Bronco. But, uh, you know, I went in there. He was, he was a veteran. He was slick. Um, he had the moves. And I just knew that my youth, my power, my skills would have been too much for him. And in that fight, you know, I just kind of systematically broke down Bronco McCart. And, uh, you know, he was game there for, for a handful of rounds, but I think it just took its toll on him. You then fought my old sparring partner, Leonard Pierre. So I went and moved up to Catskill with Kevin Rooney and trained with Leonard uh, back in about 2000, 2001. I dined out on the, on the fact that he beat the living shit out of me in sparring a few times. Um, and Leonard, you know, I think, I want to say Leonard was unbeaten going into the fight with you, or maybe he lost to John Duddy. I can't recall. I can't either. I think he might have been undefeated. I had to go back and check. Um, to be honest with you, uh, not in a mean way, but that wasn't really, you know, that was a fairly uh, simple fight. He was just oh, short. Oh, man, he fought. yeah. You, he, you, yeah, he, he got, you found it. You found your range with him early, and he couldn't get past yeah. your long, your long shots. And I think the sure. biggest thing he did, yeah, the biggest thing he did wrong was he he was short and he fought short, yeah. you know, and um, that just left me, you know, uh, target practice. And uh, again, with the power and everything else. And, you know, I had a little more hype. You know, that was uh, only my second fight at the time back home in Youngstown, you know. So, you know, I had a little adrenaline pump going, too. It was a feature spot on TV, though, wasn't it? You know, you, you were coming out. You were becoming to be you were coming to be big news by this point. Yeah, it was the versus network. We were frustrated at that point. Don't get me wrong. Um, we were really frustrated in my career at that point, you know, and it kind of had me back on my heels a little bit um, because I, I thought I should be on HBO or Showtime or headlining an ESPN because ESPN at that time, they really showed contenders. You know, they weren't big. They weren't putting on championship fights like you see now with Lomachenko and some of these other guys. Um ESPN was more of a, a contender type uh, or prospect type channel, but um, I wanted to fight on, on big network, get me on, you know, not, not as a main event, but put me on as a co-main I'm signed with top rank. Um, at that time I was like 17 or 16 and 0 with 15 knockouts. And, you know, I started, I seeing guys like Jermaine Taylor, who I understand was an Olympic bronze medalist, but these guys were all getting their time. Why couldn't I get it? So I was frustrated, but yeah, we, we opened up with the Leonard Pierre fight that was on the versus network. Uh, they were new, they came on, they were putting fights on and then it kind of, you know, started taking off a little bit more after that. So I've done this. I've had a conversation with Bruce Trampler in Vegas, who's obviously the top ranked matchmaker. And it's funny you talk about being impatient because Bruce was, was saying that you're one of the, like, one of the guys they got the timing almost impeccably right for in terms of, 
who you fought, when you fought, and how they moved, how they moved you. With hindsight, as, as impatient as you might have been at the time, you can't say they did anything wrong on that way to the title, did they? You might have been impatient at the time, but hey, it it, it was it was it was a classic form of matchmaking the way they they took you through. A little bit of it. Um, let's not get it twisted on that part with Bruce. And actually, that, that was a lot of Cameron Duncan. You know, that was, I would say, 90% of Cameron. Um, I fought some guys that a lot of prospects wouldn't fight coming up, especially at that time before. Like, now they're moving fighters a little quicker. Um, you know, PVC and some of these promotional companies do. But there was fights that I took that a lot of a lot of guys wouldn't have had. There was, for instance, the Financio Zuniga fight for the NABF. I'm prime. I'm right at that spot. You see guys today like Andrade and Charlo. I mean, Charlo's are championship uh, quality fighters who are still not really taking big step ups. You know, I fought Zuniga. He was 17 and one with 16 knockouts. He was signed by top rank. The dude could fight for a small title. You could bet your ass that a lot of them guys would have took in that fight. Um, you know, and that's no lie. So, you know, I fought guys like Grady Burr coming up. People knew Grady was a, a sharp fighter. Cedric Johnson was a dangerous guy. Um, you know, so and, and then to make it seven seven years as a pro, it was a little dangerous too because I don't care how good you are, um, it's hard to stay un, unbeaten. Your window in boxing's that big, and it goes seven years. You know, without anything happening, um, it, it was. So, do I? Am I? Do I think uh, top rank? I still say this today. I still think they're one of the top promotional companies in the sport because they do move their fighters the right way. Um, you can't deny that. You know, they don't just throw their fighters in there to hurry up and get a championship. They they really build a, a championship uh, caliber fighter. But, um, you know, I, I think there should have been a little bit earlier on that I could have had a shot. But to this, am I pissed about it now? Not really. You know, I was a former, I was a world champion. So, you know, it is what it is. So you had these tough fights with Zatushi as well, who was who was rough, and then obviously Edison Miranda, who was probably, arguably, but probably at his prime then, who was who was ferocious. Jack said going into that fight, the plan was to bully the bully, and obviously, you know, that, that's brave talk because the idea is obviously that Miranda was this machine, this destroyer, and yeah. your idea was to actually destroy him before he got to you. It's dang- a dangerous game. No, it is. Uh, a lot of people thought I was crazy as hell. They wanted to send me to a psych ward um, to say I was going to go in and back up Edison Miranda. Um, and I think even a commentator said that during a countdown or some uh, Lampley said, he said he's going to go in there and back up Miranda. And he laughed. He goes, nobody backs up Miranda. But, uh, you know, th- th- that was a frustrating situation there too, because let's go back to Zartucci. Zartucci, very high risk, low reward fight. Here I am. I'm not saying that I wanted a, a tomato can by no means, but a lot of your prospects would have avoided Zartucci. Okay. He was just one of them type fighters. Here I fight him. It was supposed to be for a number one mandatory WBC contender. You know, they gave me the big plaque after the fight. I, I go and I, I knock out Zartucci and I thought I had, I thought I was in line for the title fight. And then I get a call from Cameron Duncan and he goes, ah, no, well, you got one more. I'm going, all right, I'll get through them. I go, who? And he's like, Edison Miranda. I was like, God damn it. <laughs> I was like, I ain't, I ain't meant to win a to win a title, man. Um, but we went in there with Miranda. I broke the film down. The reason why I got the game plan for that fight was because I've, I've watched how he wasn't able to go on his back foot, you know. And nobody backed Edison Miranda up, and not many people tried. Uh, also trying to box Edison Miranda was dangerous because he was unorthodox. You know, he would throw punches from – all different angles. Uh, he wasn't your technical fighter. You know, he was, and when you moved around on him, it was dangerous. So my game plan was screw up about how hard he hits. How about he tries to deal with my power, my punch out put and my, my chin, you know, and, and let's back him up. And that was the game plan. You took thousands of fans to Atlantic City. Did you know a lot of those people? Over here, we have people who sell their tickets, whether it's being R- Ricky Hatton or Josh Warrington, who go to bars and pubs and they 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 have a circuit and they go around and sell tickets to people in the towns and villages all those thousands of fans that started going to atlantic city for your fights did did were they just youngstown fans or did you know a lot of these people yeah they they were youngstown and somewhere along the line i ran into them um a lot of the people i did know and a lot of them i kind of kind of knew um 
again, 6,000 is a lot. So there was a lot of people, you know, that I may have said hi to or whatnot, but I probably wouldn't remember, you know, by, by meeting them. Um, you know, that's the one thing with Youngstown. It definitely has its downs, but you'll never get a fan base. I don't think any team or any fighter could get a fan base like, like Youngstown. And I can tell you right now, we were talking with a manager after the, after the uh, Taylor fight. And your guys' boy, Ricky Hatton, that fought there not too long before, right? And everybody knows that the UK has the best fans as well, right? I mean, you guys just get into these fights. You're, you're allowed. You play the drums. And you're into it, right? And it's awesome. And she goes, she came up. She goes, we love you and we hate you here. And I'm like, what the hell did that do? And she's like, you were first people to drink us out of beer. And then we had to restock. And um, I and we all like laughed about that. And I said, you're telling me that this was crazier than like when Ricky Hatton had fought here? And she goes, yeah. She goes, it was close. But, you know, she's like, we, we haven't really seen this. And, uh, you know, I thought that was kind of cool. You know, it was just really neat to see that. That's great. So Boxing News said that you took about three and a half thousand to four thousand for the Taylor fight. Jack told me at the time in an interview I did with Jack, I looked up uh, that you were actually working then with a children's cancer society. Yes, I was actually I was all over um, and I still to this day, you know, that's a big thing with me. Um, but I always kept everything usually under the radar, too. I didn't want people you know, making it public that I do to charities because that's just not my style. Uh, but I was with Akron Children's. I was with hospice. Um, I wounded war vets for a little bit. So I would I would do charities like that all the time. What did you think Jermaine would try to do in your first fight? Because he was under fire at the time for being boring. He'd had Corey Spinks, Winky Wright, Kasim Uma. And people were saying, you know, he, he's not kicked on from the Hopkins fight. People were really, really quite nasty about Jermaine. So were you expecting him to be negative? with you or from the amateurs were you expecting him to come and try and make a statement oh absolutely because i'm still confused on that i mean you know i'm not saying this to build my one up it's just the, the true hard facts you know look at the guys he fought right before me you know he fought kasim uma kasim uma was known to make everybody look bad kasim uma threw a uh, hundred punches around you know he was just an awkward fighter who else did he fight winky Wright. i think everybody knows who who has ever looked good against winky Wright. You know what I mean? I think right now Winky Wright can come out of retirement and fight, and he'll make uh, he'll make uh, Canelo look awkward. So, you know, he he fight he just took some fights that his handlers probably should have second guessed on, and that that was the whole case. Uh, Jermaine was was a, a bad dude and going into that fight. I knew that. Plus, I knew he had a lot of animosity because of, <laughs> because of the shit he was taking, you know, from from the mother fight. So. Um, we knew we had to be on our A game for that fight. We really did. We knew that he was coming out with something to prove and we had to be ready for it. People would have just heard your dog bark. People also know that I'm a big dog fan from Instagram and all the rest of it. And I do this podcast for the dog walkers out there. What have you got? I got three of them. So I got a Norwegian elk hound. Uh, she's a little older right now. We got a, a German shepherd. And then that one that you heard barking was my Australian shepherd. Okay, so I've got two pugs and a French bulldog pug cross. So I'm way smaller. I'm way way further down the food chain from you guys. Hey, I'll take one of those. Like, cleaning this fur up and all that crap, man. It's, it gets pain in the ass. <laughs> so against Jermaine, round seven, you broke through and he crumpled. But what 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 was the feeling like when your dream came true? Because it was it was a fight of the year contender. It was a it was a it was an incredible fight. You'd been down and hurt, rallied, and it was extraordinary. Yeah. Um, it's, it's crazy, but you're you're just filled with excitement. You're filled with all this emotion that that's running through. It's really hard, man, uh, to go back. Um, you try you could explain to people, but it's just hard to explain. Um, it was just everything was so fast. There was just so much going on um, after the fight. Like you know, you won the world title, but you just don't really realize like what you did. You know what I mean? It's one of those weird things. Um, it was awesome. But it was even more satisfying, I would say, a couple years later, you know, when especially after you retire and you look back on it and you're like, holy shit. Like, you know, I think I, I still should have been undisputed, in my opinion, because, you know, there's a lot of things on that 
you know, a way for, only way for an undisputed champion to not be undisputed is he has to lose the fight. Well, Jermaine was undisputed and he didn't lose a fight. He lost his belts by um, vacating or, or getting, you know, politics part of it. So he wasn't beaten. I was the only person to beat him. And, uh, but I was the lineal champion, which is still huge. I mean, not, there's not many lineal champions and being uh, at the time, one of the few American um, champions, you know, so there was just a lot behind a lot of emotion. And as you, as I got older, you really started appreciating, you know, the accomplishment. Yeah. No one could take it away from you. Yep. That's true. Uh, how much trouble were you in in round two? Oh man, it was a weird one. Um, so the knockdown legs were gone and it was one of the ones you have a couple of different types of knockdowns. Um, some people get rocked and they get up and they look good, but they're out of it. And mine was where I actually, I could tell you who was screaming in the audience when I got dropped, but uh, my legs were just gone. You know, uh, it was just one of those type of things. Like I'm going shit, you know, inside of my head. And uh, my whole thing was, I went back and I thought about what Steve Smoker was saying you know, in a locker room before the fight, he goes, as long as you show me that you're able to hold on or that you're you're with it, he goes, I won't stop the fight. And I think the big part um, was holding on, grabbing Jermaine and, and punching back on the brakes that, you know, showed uh, Smoger that I was I was good. Once I got through that second round, I knew that fight was mine. I knew it. So Jack had told me that you struggled, that you get down to 163 easy and then the, the last three pounds would hurt you. That was his quote saying it would hurt you. How, what did that struggle look like? We've, we've obviously touched upon weight bacon at the start, but was that brutal for you, those last three pounds? Yeah, man, we got used to it there for a while. I mean, it happened with Bronco McCart. It happened with Zuniga. Um, and again, as the older you get, you start, you know, it's harder to make weight. You know, I, I think it was actually really cool that I was able to go a decade, you know, staying at the weight that I did, but yeah, it, it became a problem, but I don't think it was any more worse than what Jermaine Taylor was going through. So again, going back on that, as we were talking, making weight is one of the biggest things in boxing, you know, um, how much do you have to dry out for a camp? And it really comes down to what camp is fighting harder to make weight and who's going to have more energy come fight night. So we were confident that Jermaine was struggling as well. Obviously that's why he wanted to catch weight that, you know, 164, but uh, yeah, it sucks, man. It's never fun. You know, you no matter how good you do throughout camp, you know that there's going to come a period where you're going to have to dry out and, and try to make weight. So you know, that's the one thing when I retired that I didn't miss at all. What does that drying out look like and how long is that period? Well, I can really give you the one for Sergio Martinez fight where I didn't think I was going to make it to the ring, but um, you are, uh, you're there, you go probably just say Friday, weigh-ins or Friday afternoon. It probably starts Wednesday afternoon. So Wednesday morning, you eat a light salad, hardly any dressing. And if the dressing is balsamic, um, you eat that. You'll probably eat some chicken, maybe a little bit of rice to get some type of carbs in you for some form of energy to burn. And then starting Wednesday night is dry out. You know, you may have a couple of sips of water. Um, that's it. Thursday, you ain't getting shit. And you could go to the sauna and try to sweat out some weight. And a lot of times, especially towards the end there, going to the sauna wasn't doing anything but harm. You know, I had nothing in me to sweat out. So we would be on a stationary bike, treadmill, just back to burning calories. And then, um, you know, come Friday, it was always great to have an early weigh-in. Sometimes you had the noon or one o'clock weigh-in that really sucked because you're drying out all the way up to that point. It was brutal, horrible. Is there a school of thought that, that tells you that you would have been a better fighter, stronger, more physical, and, and better at 168 without that struggle? Absolutely. Absolutely. But it is what it is. And it's the camp's choice to uh, stay at 160. And it's a wonderful title. At that time, why would, I, why would I leave? You know what I mean? 168 was packed, and you would have to kind of backtrack to be relevant at 168, you know, you had a shitload of fighters. Um, for me at 160, I, I felt that there were still big fights out there. You know, I did want to Paul Williams. Unfortunately, those fights fell through, not through me or Paul Williams, but through the promotional uh, disagreements. Um, Arthur Abraham, Felix Sturm, I wanted those fights, but they didn't want to budge on it. They wanted, I was the lineal champion and they wanted me to go over to, over to their country to fight, which made no sense. So 
Yeah, you're kind of you've kind of let forward a couple of questions, so I'll come back in a sec. But while we're on this, I mentioned I was going to mention Sturm and Abraham at the time. I was wondering uh, as well if you if you if there was any chance of you fighting um, Kessler or Froch. Were, were either of them ever close or talked about seriously? No, because they were at 68. Froch was a little towards the end of my career. Listen, I would love to fight Froch. Um, you know, let's go back. I know you can't use spice as measure sticks, but you can a little bit. You know, Jermaine Taylor was out boxing the crap out of Fr Carl Frosch in that fight. Um, if Jermaine, in my opinion, takes one more knee in that last round, and instead of trying to fight through getting hurt, he could, he had him far enough ahead to win it on the scorecards. Um, Frosch was a, a tough dude, though. Frosch could fight. He hit hard. He had pretty good chin. He was in good shape. But I think Frosch was right there for me. And I, and I think that would have been a good fight. Um, Abraham. But I would have loved that one. The Abraham Stern fight, those were more trophy fights if they would have happened in, in the United States. And here's the reason. I would have vacated them belts after I won them. So I would have just fought for them, put them in a trophy case, and have them um, because the sanction and fees are crazy. And that's why you don't see many people hold on to all four belts because by the time you get done paying sanction and fee for each belt, it really – puts a dent into your uh your pot your check so i wouldn't have kept those um but yeah uh miguel kessler i think miguel was a good fighter really do talented and i think it was a, a winnable fight for me um but yeah unfortunately they were 68 and i was 60 so and that that leads me to kawasaki as well because uh in fact i interviewed you before kessler kawasaki and you were you thought you were leaning towards kessler at the time uh, but you and Kalzaghi came close, and I think um, uh, what it, you you and Kalzaghi was around the same time he was thinking of fight, fighting Hopkins. Yeah, so I did. I wanted Kalzaghi. Uh, Kalzaghi, one of the most underrated champions of all time, um, Duke could fight, and everybody knows that I love the challenges. You know, I love taking the fights. You know, and uh, unfortunately, the fight again never fell through. I don't know if top rank wanted that fight overseas or if they wanted to do it in the States. I don't know. I can't remember exactly what happened with that one, but Kalzagi, um, win or lose, you know, I would have loved to have that fight. These guys were talking about dream opponents, potential for fight fans. Who would, who was, if you could have had any of them, Abraham, Kessler, Froch, Kalzagi, who would you, which one would you have liked? I would have liked the Butte. I would have liked the Froch. Definitely. Um, you know, uh, who else? Andre Ward, you know, and that one was close. That 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 was that was icing on a cake for retirement. But um, Andre Ward was a close one. I would love to because again the challenge of it, you know, Abraham Sturm. Again, going back to that, I would have liked them fights more so for the, the belts just to put up. But um, they they weren't big money paying fights or nothing like that. So, you know, in a sport, I did it because I wanted to fight the best. But also, you know, it had to be worth it too because it's a brutal it's a brutal fucking sport and uh so that yeah so those are some of the big fights i would like to have had i love it i love it the ghost wants all the smoke um you had a spell with arthritis in your hands how how bad did that get oh man that you know that was um it was an irritating lingering problem throughout the career um especially you know a lot of it through the amateurs because of the power and hitting hard and um, I mean, I trained with 18 ounce gloves numerous times in sparring and, and trying to get my hand right. But it, it was I, in between fights and then during training camp, I lived at a, at a chiropractor, you know, um, getting my hands right. And then you told me back in the day that your mum could never watch you fight. Did that ever change? No, she uh, unfortunately she passed wow. uh, three years ago. But you know, even up till then, she watched him after. You know, she would watch the fights after afterwards, and and she was uh, telling me everything I did wrong, what I did right, but live she couldn't do it. You fought Jermaine again. You outpointed him. Did you just have his number? I think so, and I knew the second fight was going to be um, a tougher fight. You know, uh, he was pissed. You know, he had a lot to, to come back, and Jermaine's a brilliant boxer, and. Uh, I think that fight was really a meaningful fight to me too, because nobody was giving me a chance in hell to beat Jermaine. Everybody kept saying the only way Kelly beats Jermaine Taylor is if he knocks him out again, but if it goes the distance, he's going to get outpointed. And I was scratching my head because in that first fight, if the knockdown don't happen, I'm up, 
You know, I gave I gave Jermaine the second round, 10-8, and I gave him the fifth round. I won every round in between. I mean, it wasn't really close. So I don't understand how people thought he would outbox me, but you know, it was a good fight. You didn't get Calzaghe, but you did get another Welshman and Gary Lockett, who uh, has been in the archives here, sort of talking about how hard you hit. Uh, very complimentary about you. And then came Bernard Hopkins. What did you think of Bernard going into the fight? And people were saying he was on the the back end and the downside, and you were the new you were the new kid on the block. Yeah, I don't know. Bernard went on to win a, a real title after um, Bernard fight. I, I don't touch on it more because I don't want to get to the slamming of I make excuses, but we could just put it this way that it was not my night. Um, and there's a lot of documented things with that fight, but on the flip side of it, let's be honest, Bernard Hopkins is probably one of the, the best technicians in boxing history. Um, the guy was probably has the best footwork and never will get the credit for it and was just smart. You know, Bernard was, was a master at suffocating your punches getting you off balance, uh, moving, switching up his punches. And, you know, it was just a shitty night. And and Bernard, you know, executed. He's just a, a great fighter. Did that night Did that night take something from you that you didn't get back? No. Because we came back after that fight and fought a, a very uh, game fighter, Antonio Rubio, who ended up going on to win a, a world title, knocking out. David Lemieux, who at the time was 25 and 0 with 25 knockouts. And I dominated a guy like, like uh, Antonio Rubio, you know, I, I, for eight rounds. So, you know, I don't think it did anything uh, as far as taking anything out. I know a lot of people say that he zapped it for me in that fight, but I'm not the same person that gets caught up in that shit. You know, um, it is what it is. And, and I moved on after that fight. Just to point this out for those listening, you weighed 10 pounds more for Hopkins than you weighed in your previous fight four months earlier, which showed it was a big physical jump for you into that Hopkins fight. People see you as the young lion, but you actually moved up in weight and, and a good amount of weight as well. You could actually consider it two weight classes because I believe it was a catch weight of 72. So, And you mentioned Rubio and then came Miguel Espino. Um, what were you in the sport for at this point? Like, you know, after Hopkins, was it to go, was it to win at 168? Was it to win at 160 to reclaim your former glories? What what, what were you in for, yeah. money? Yeah, money and, and, and the big fights. And again, at that time, it's just, it all comes down to promotional and who can you fight, who's out there to fight. And, uh, you know, staying active. I think top rank wanted to keep me active after the loss to Hopkins and with the right opponents. Um, you know, and I think obviously they were gearing up for a big fight with Martinez. What did you make of Sergio going into that fight? So another one, um, and that was where the, the weight issue came in. But Sergio Martinez can't knock him. Duke a fight, hell of a hell of a boxer. Um, got the moves, everything else. Uh, it was a great fight. Um, after the ninth round, I was up on the scorecards. Um, I, I think the, the commentators had me up. I'm not sure on the unofficial, but you know it was a good fight, and I just hit the wall. I hit the wall in the tenth round. Um, and there's, and a lot of people say that the cut was the issue and it wasn't the cut. If I was cut or not, you know, the, those last couple of rounds would have been the way they were. Nothing I could do about it. Um, it was just a brutal, brutal camp trying to cut weight. Um, the beginning of the fight, you know, he had won some rounds. He was slick. He moved, you know, I think I caught on to him there pretty well, but, uh, Sergio could fight, man. People, that's another one. You don't get the credit. Sergio was a, a fantastic uh, boxer. Was it hard to take these losses to Hopkins or Martinez, or was it easier to take the losses because there were other factors at play, whether it was what was going on before Hopkins or making the weight for Sergio? Absolutely. I knew the reason. Never really came out publicly and, and did it. You know what I mean? I'm not pulling a Wilder, you know, so um, it, 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 it is what it is. You know, people are going to always say, oh, you're, you're full of shit. And I had a lot of fighters, you know, fighters understand that some nights ain't your night, but, uh, no, it don't bother me because another thing is, too, I had two losses to two Hall of Famers. You know, again, I say with Bernard. So it is what it is. Um, I'm always a person. I say, like, pull your head out of your ass and move on. You know, and that's the way it is. That's how I look at life. And, um, you know, again, at the end of the day, I had three world title belts, you know, and, and uh, I consider the ring, the ring is as big as any world title fight or belt. So I'm content, you know, definitely. You had a year out after Martinez. Had you walked away? 
no, it was just a lie. I didn't completely walk away. I was up in the air. So here's another big one. A lot of people don't understand, and they always throw out their their reasons and and what they think. Um, I never got into boxing to be in it for the long run. Um, I actually made a promise to my wife, my parents. So I said, I've, you know, I'm going to be in 10, 11 years, which was early on, you know, before everything happened. But I, I always looked on a, a quick exit from, from boxing. Um, hence the reason, again, I've done very well for myself, fortunately, after retirement. But that's why I retired young. You know, there's always like demons, this, that, blah, 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 blah. I didn't want to do it sport. I, I was boxing was more of a burden to me. I did it. I pushed myself to train my ass off for every fight. Um, that, which is the reason why I threw so many punches per round. Um, but it was something that I, I, I looked forward after winning the title. Most guys are looking for next big championship fights. I was looking for next big fights, but, um, financial security. I was counting down to retirement, you know, um, that's the way I looked at it. And that's why when I walked away from the sport, no matter if, if there was other reasons I walked away, I would have came back. I was done. I was done with it and then wanted to do with it. In uh, well, why did you leave Jack Lowe and Youngstown to go and train with Robert Garcia at that period in, in Oxnard? Was it just a, a, f- a fresh coat of paint and fresh coat of paint and to, to, to try something different? At that point in the career, it, it, yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, the big thing, top rank for a long time, you know, when I, they wanted Jack gone from the beginning, unfortunately, you know, when I signed with them, they wanted it, um, 2005 or 2003, they sent me to go train with Pat Berry and without Jack. And, and I bitched and moaned, you know, that, uh, I, I'm not fighting if Jack is not in the corner. So they, they brought Jack out for that fight. 2005, they sent me out there to the Diego Corrales, uh, Castillo fight and that's because my five-year you know contract was up so they sent me out to renew and you know they want they talked to me to get me to leave so I, I did a, a big thing you know a lot of people don't understand that you know when I left Jack there was a lot of people in Youngstown like oh you're not loyal people don't understand the, the risk that I put my career at numerous times you know to to not have Jack leave the camp but when 2011 came, I think top rank, let's be honest, you know, I, I wasn't fighting much. I had injuries. I was up on the fence if I wanted to retire or not. And I think we all wanted to see if there was a change that could have sparked my career. You know what I mean? And we all came to an agreement that let's go out to Garcia. Let's get out to California and see how that goes and, and get with the new guy. And I think that only ruined it more for me. I loved Love being out there with Garcia camp. Great, great people. Uh, Robert, obviously, his accolades talk for themselves how good of a trainer he is. And I, I learned a good amount out there. But at that point, you know, when, when you up and leave your, your own place, your, your home, usually people at the beginning of their career up and leave. When a prospect or guys are trying to get to big money fights, win a world title, very rarely do you see a guy who already had the world titles for three years up and leave his home after making millions to go away from his family. Um, and it was hard. It really was at that point. You know, I just lost a lot for the sport, um, you know, and, and there was no big fights available at that time. So I was fighting guys like Rosinski, Sigmund, and uh, the Super Six tournament was going on. They were booked, you know. And uh, at the point of retirement after the Rosinski fight, um, I had a little spark because they were talking about Andre Ward fight. And it was like close. And I mean, I was pumped up as hell for that to be able to fight a guy at the caliber of, of Andre Ward. And then unfortunately that's when Ward had the shoulder injury and he was out and it was icing on a cake for me. I was done. Did you get the itch for the first couple of years? No, not at all. Actually the first two years I didn't left boxing. You know I mean? I, if unless it was a mega fight like Floyd Mayweather or something like that, I, I didn't, I really didn't play no mind to it. Um, and, but here and there, I would say around 2014 or 2015, 16, I don't think I wanted to fight. I think I just missed everything surrounding it. But then that's when I went out and got the podcast and me and my uh, co-host started going to the fights and covering fights again. And that kind of fulfilled me, you know, that, that fulfilled that part of being in the spotlight or this or that. And I uh, really I really came to the, the knowledge of knowing that I didn't want to fight anymore. 
you also piled on the weight by doing a lot of different weights. By, by, you were powerlifting, weren't you? You were doing, you know, all your standard squats and deadlifts and that kind of stuff. Did that yeah, help well, you not, did that help you think, well, you know, I'm, that, I'm not going to see 160 again? Because you were about, what, 220, 230? Yeah, well, I was up to 250. Um, I'm down to 225 now. I kind of cut back on that because it takes a toll on the, on the body, you know. As like kind of wiping your ass before you shit. Made no <laughs> sense, you know. I, I go from boxing to powerlifting. But, um, yeah, I, I was doing that there for a while. I still lift. Obviously, I own a, a fitness center. Um, but uh, it, it helped fill the void. I think the biggest thing was getting back into boxing through through the podcast and being able to go to these big fights and cover them. That, that really filled that void uh, more than anything. But, yeah, being back in competition mode a little bit with the powerlifting, it was fun, you know, and uh, I still love doing it. Um, but I just don't go as heavy and I don't do the powerlifting type stuff. So it did help. Them. Now I know I've spoken to you about this in the past and in different interviews we've done, I've, I have always asked you, you're supposed to be an absolute hellraiser who loves to go out and drink all the time and, you know, cause mayhem in Youngstown and you've made all the headlines before and stuff and you've been infamous. But I've not seen that side of you. I can't grind it. I've got to say we've never been out drinking together, but you know you're very different in the way we talk about to how i was how i would have believed you were when i when i used to read all these headlines about you what's well, the deal what's the deal with that small town um small town talk um let's let's not get it twisted here uh you know i did go out and have fun that's how i lived and and again i'm not doing a like point finger but it's just realistic that's what youngstown is you drive through you, you drive through Mahoney County or a Tri-County area, and if you make it 10 feet outside of a residential area without a bar, bar, restaurant, or anything going on, I would be absolutely surprised. Um, so I, I was hearing a lot during the time, and I would get pissed. I'm going, most people are drinking their weekly pay away, and I'm the, the person that can be there. Everybody has a problem with it. Um, did I do stupid shit? Absolutely. You know what I mean? Um, but was it, did it be, uh, deserve um, headlines for it? I don't think so. Let's, let's go back and recap some of them and I'll do it for you. So in Youngstown, which is ranks is usually one of the most dangerous cities to live in and it's supposed to be a blue collar town, uh, um, which I, I do love, so I'm not knocking it. Um, I got in trouble for a four wheeler and a lamppost. Made headlines for that, a BB gun, not even a real gun, a BB gun. Um, I got in a, uh, we were doing a mosh pit at a Foo Fighters concert in my hometown. <clears throat> Me and my buddy were screwing around and it turned a little like the slap boxing slash mosh pit. I got cuffed. He didn't. I did. So if we were fighting, why wouldn't both parties get, you know, arrested? And it was just, I think once, once that started hitting it, hitting it, uh, the media loved it. They followed it and, so did the people um there was so much and one day I, I will write a book on it but there's just so much shit that goes with it you know what i mean um it was petty bullshit shit but on the on the other side of that though where i have to be honest a person in my situation should i have known better absolutely um should i have known like hey kel pull back from it a little too much fun a little too much out there i, I think so and i think now that as as you get older and you mature and you see the shit that happens and then especially my kids, you know, more of the pullback and, and not doing anything is more so my kids don't have to endure, have to share. So that's where I pulled my head out of my ass and I got involved with all the different investments that I have now and, and all the other different ventures and, and uh, things that I'm doing was to kind of just pull away from that. So there was no more headlines. Just a couple of things. Uh, what was the BB gun thing? Were you shooting up the neighborhood? No, I was doing a phone <laughs> charge, my man, real quick. So I was doing a um I was putting a lake in my backyard and I was actually actually helping out a buddy, uh, a so-called buddy, not a, a big time friend of mine, but somebody I knew. He was going through a hard time. So he um he needed help. He needed some work. Uh and I was putting this this uh, pond in and you know, he stayed at my house. I took care of him. I took care of his kids. I fed him. I paid him like 700 a week to just to feed him a house. And he stayed at my house. So 
he uh the one day we they, there was people out there shooting a bb gun i come home he shot a guy the day before in the ankle with it i come home and, and we we're screwing around and he was in my my lake butt naked and uh i shot him with the bb gun and for just off now this is how fucked up it is in youngstown for two days two days afterwards he stayed at my house again i fed his kids i, I would cook out he had he stayed there for two days. He put pictures up on Facebook that he's at my house laughing about the BBO and everything else. Long story short, two days after uh, that night, his uncle who worked for the sheriff's department comes to my house and knocks. That dude was passed out on my couch. Um, I say, yeah, I go, <laughs> what's going on? He's like, hey, is uh, this kid Brian here? And I was like, uh, no, not right now. And he goes, okay, he goes, hey, Kelly, listen, he goes, he has a warrant out for his arrest, and I don't want to get you in trouble or have to bring more people here and cause a scene. He goes, if he comes back, let me know. So I go back in the house. I let Brian know. I said, Brian, go, listen, I'm not getting in trouble for you, dude. Like, fucking leave, go somewhere. I was like, you ain't got to go back. He wouldn't do it. So finally, you know, I know they were going to come back. People say that I ratted them out. Listen. I didn't know that dude anything. I took care of him and his family. You know what I mean? He's putting my ass on the line. So I called his uncle. I said, he's here if you want him. He goes and does two months, two months in the jail, right? Two months. Takes off his scrubs or whatever you call it, the Joe Bird uh, outfit, and walks over to the sheriff's and files charges against me. And they loved it. They loved it. <clears throat> Filed assault. <clears throat> uh, shot him with a BB gun. We, we told them, we told the prosecutors that we had pictures of, of Facebook post that it wasn't an assault. It was playing around. He stayed at my house for two days after, and they nobody cared on that one. So that was the BB gun incident. And, uh, you know, I laugh about it now. now. I was a little pissed then. You know, I'll never forget. I had uh, one of the big writing companies go, don't you live in a blue collar town? You know, ain't, ain't Youngstown tough? And I was like, yeah. They're like, you got all this shit going on here at the time. All these politicians were um, in Youngstown were up on like numerous counts of uh, felony counts against them. And my, my BB gun was the headline. So. Hey, I'm sure everyone listening to this is dying to know where, where in the body do you shoot a naked guy? Oh, in the arm. <laughs> <laughs> um, the baby fat. One other thing. I, I, you... I really wasn't trying to hit him. I was screwing, but he, you know, he's, long wingspan and he had it out and it caught him in the arm um have you ever had a drink problem um i don't know i i, I guess you could consider it that absolutely um I, I had fun you know it was nothing to the point of like you know people say rock bottom and shit like that i i went out and, and overdid it absolutely um and again that's where i go on like yeah they were all small pitter bat pitter patty baby shit but it was just too much of them starting to happen you know like one next to another and and uh you know that's when i kind of like i said i pulled my head out of my ass and and you know started getting busy and it just wasn't wasn't worth it anymore do you drink at all now or are you sober no i haven't i i haven't now shit four years okay Okay, so uh, the last time we spoke, I mentioned it at the top there, we were in Canastota and I was speaking to you about CTE for a book that I'm working on, or what has just come out called Damage. And in fact, I quoted you in the book. Um, that's something that plays on your mind a little bit, doesn't it? And it's certainly when you talked about being in and out of the sport quick, that was that was part of your, that Huge. was part of what made your decisions. Huge part. And you know, believe me, people still trying to, I mean, I just had, conversation with a handful of people in a boxing game trying to get me to come back to fight Paul brothers and this and that. And I'm like, no, man, because it's not to fight. Not that I'm afraid. I beat the Paul brothers, you know, not fighting for 10 years and, and not even training. And I could go in there and do that. But it's it's everything that comes with it. Uh, I'm, I'm big with that. Uh, you know, I got a handful of people here. Um, a guy that played in the NFL, actually. You know, I talked with him. You know, they got some companies out right now. I guess Brett Favre is big in that. And uh, they're working on, you know, the CTE and, and all the other different brain injury, brain trauma stuff. So, yeah, I pay attention to it. Do you worry about it? I do. I do because the shit is, you know, right now I, I feel fine. And people will tell, probably say that I talk all fucked up, but I've done that. You know, I talk like this for a long time. Big lips, they get in the way. Um, but 
you know, that stuff is something that comes on over time. You know, some people unfortunately get it a lot faster. Some could, some people can live till they're 90 and not have an issue with it. So, um, no, but it is something that you constantly got to think about. And again, I'm, I'm all down for the studies they got going on. I research a lot of stuff on it. So no, I am big with that. I'm not asking you to be irresponsible here and speculate stupidly, but do you wonder about Jermaine Taylor and what's happened to him down the line and CTE and how his behavior apparently has changed from, you would have known him obviously back in the amateurs in the pre-Olympic days to, to what's happened to, you know, how he's, you know, seemingly unraveled down the line. I definitely think there's something to do with it. Hey, listen, athletes are put in a spot. And I know a lot of people will go, oh, they make millions and this and that, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of shit that goes on. You know, your life ain't your life no more. You you know, especially at that level, you know, you got to deal with a lot of shit from, from society, believe it or not. But I, I do believe that there was a handful of other things that come into play. I think that he, you know, I don't know if it, I know alcohol, drug abuse was one of it. And, and I absolutely think that there was some um, CTE or something wrong up here for some of the stuff, you know, so going back on that, you talk about BB guns, four wheelers, and then you talk about stabbing, sh- sh- really shooting somebody. I mean, it's night and day um, situations. And I, I think at that point, they're, they're, maybe there is something there and maybe they should, you know, they have a lot of places. Now you have the Cleveland Clinic and, and uh, neurology in, in Las Vegas, which is pretty good. You know, a lot of fighters are going to that place. And I think that's maybe something in the future Jermaine may want to look into. So how are you now in Youngstown? Are you a hero like Ray was, or are you a villain, or are you just a normal guy who keeps himself to himself? Like, what, how, how, how do people see you there? I still get to, you know, you still get the shit talkers, but you also got the people who support and, and are there. And, they, you know, and I, everywhere I go, I still talk to somebody. I mean, a uh, five-minute trip is, is a 15-minute trip. Um, so it's cool. You know what I mean? Like, honestly, to the point, I don't give a shit. You know, like I said, I... I the thing I do is I, I move forward. I keep grinding. I do what I got to do. Um, you know, like I said, I got investments out there that I got to worry about and um, a lot of big things. So it is what it is. You know, if somebody wants to talk to me, I don't care. Um, if they do, I'll sit there and talk with anybody. You know, I don't ever push anybody to the side or, or um, you know, cut off anybody. Uh, I, I take it how it is. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I like uh, everything kind of small t- uh, town too so everybody here there was like 70,000 a population of 70,000 in the last 15 years I've I've said hi and ran into everybody so there ain't much to see <laughs> um yeah no which is great and then obviously you mentioned your, your podcast and also like your social media presence is going up and up on Instagram in the sense that you're really interactive people can reach out to you with questions and you're being very proactive. The content you're putting up is really, really entertaining and useful. So anyone, anyone who doesn't already follow you needs to check you out on Instagram. No, hell yeah. Um, so I got with a woman, uh, you know, what do you call it? Influence, social media influencer. And, uh, you know, it's that point too, because it's 2021. And if you're behind the game, you know, everything is technology now and, and social media form. And <clears throat> so I just want to kind of get out there on that. Um, and be a part of it again because i would get i would get emails i would get text messages and and different people and people want to know what's going on in my life and what am i doing now and like what's what happened after the career well what easier way instead of personally texting somebody or calling or being on the phone than to be on social media instagram you know facebook so that's kind of the route that we took and you mentioned your kids earlier. What, what, who, what, how many kids have you got? And are any of them going to be, uh, be fighters? Are you, are you up for that? Two. No, they won't be. Uh, my son boxes, but I got him in jujitsu and, and stuff like that. He does a little bit of wrestling. He likes all kinds of sports. My daughter is 15. You know, she's, uh, she does trekking and she does dance. Uh, I keep, I'm busy with that too, along with everything else that's going on. But no, man, I don't want to fight him. Brutal, brutal sport. Um, okay, I've got some quick fire questions from our subscribers here. Okay, uh, in fact, just before I okay. get to them, tell me about the ghost thing. Where, where was the ghost thing from? Where, how, how did you become the ghost? So the ghost came uh, more out of coincidence. I was one of the few white kids up in Cleveland uh, tournaments, and 
they, you know, I would go in there and people call me the ghost, all the other fighters. And then the one time from that tournament, the, the um, one time from that tournament, I, I brought my brother, Michael couldn't go to the fights. So I brought a, a film of, of my fight and uh, VHS days. And I put that on for him. And I was pretty slick at the time. And I would like move and bounce around. And he goes, damn, he's like, you move like a ghost in there. So it was a, a coincidence again. <clears throat> and it just kind of stuck. <clears throat> so, uh, Dowie, who asked some of the questions that we've already gone on, uh, gone on about in terms of dream opponents, but he says, you were in an era when HBO seemed quite ruthless and always forced for tough fights. It seems to have gone the other way now and broadcasters bend to the promoter more and more. Which approach do you think is better for boxing? And do you see there being a shift again? Yeah, they got some big fights. Though. I mean, some of these fights are happening. I, you know, I don't know what some of the fans um, do want. I mean, I think they want to see the fighters fight every, every tough fight possible back to back but they, now you're talking about there's no longevity with that. Um, but it has kind of slowed off too, though. And I could agree with the fans and like this guy's question, um, you know, it's more of a business. Now these promoters are just trying to position themselves with lockdown TV fights, or if there's a beef, they'll, they'll freeze the fighter from dealing with that other promotional company. And it does affect the sport a little bit. Andy Moyes says, instead of fighting Rubio and Espino, did you think of having a run at Super Middle and fighting Froch, for instance? I did. But, you know, the fight with Sergio Martinez was there. And, uh, again, those fights, people have to understand, Froch and them guys, they're in negotiations with, with other Super Middleweights. You know, and, um, or some of them were in training camps. Some of them already had fights scheduled. So it's a lot harder. There's a lot more to it than just you know, like, oh, I'm going to make a fight here. Because um, a lot of times it don't work that way. You have to first go through negotiations, and that can depend on when the fight takes place. If somebody's already in training camp for a fight, they're not going to pull and, and quit camp for that fight, especially if contracts are signed. So there's just a lot that goes into play. And, and it's hard for me to remember exactly what was going on during that period, but uh, I'm sure there was a lot. You were offered the Butte fight, but you weren't offered enough money, right? Yes. So... With that fight, well, there was there was a lot behind that one. It just wasn't the money because it was still a, a fairly good money. It wasn't what I was making for the big fights, but there was more to it than that. And, and uh, I will not get into the full detail of that one, but there's a little bit of um, top rank kind of subbed off the promotion because it was going to be in my hometown to fight a guy by the name of Daryl Cunningham. And uh, I went into the camp for that starting off and i kept asking you know because jack was dealing with uh, the promotional company on the contract and i kept asking everybody like where's the fight contract at and so after usually the second week i wasn't training i was but i wasn't you know what i mean i would show up to the gym but i kept saying i kept telling my dad and i kept telling Cameron duncan until i get a fight contract i'm not doing it because i had a feeling about something you know what i mean and then um Finally, like two weeks or three weeks before the fight, they tell me the contract came in when it should have been in. And they told me what I was getting paid in Youngstown to fight Daryl Cunningham. And I said, no, you know what I mean? And I, that Daryl Cunningham fight, it was a package deal. So like fight him for a little bit, then go over to Canada to fight Lucien Butte for an amount that I wasn't happy with. But I think if it was done different, I would have done it. You know what I mean? But there was also people involved that had no business being involved on that part of it. And it kind of pissed me off. And it just kind of pissed me off how everything was kind of hidden. You know, it was almost like if we if we give him the contract three weeks before the fight or two weeks before the fight, there's no way he'll pull out of his hometown. You know what I mean? So that was kind of the, the way they were looking at it. Like it'd be too close to the fight for him to pull out. And I, I just got pissed. And that kind of that really was the uh kicker to me going to california too um matthew blackburn says um did you already have a game plan for andre ward and what did it look like ward fight was going to use my punch output to use you know my my length as Ward's pretty tall too um i had the experience with hopkins in which andre ward and hopkins you know their styles are very similar and uh because Andre Ward, he'll get in there, he'll shoot, he'll frustrate you, he'll suffocate your punches. But, um, and again, you know, I'm not saying I would have won the fight. Um, I'm realistic. You know, Andre Ward's a phenomenal fighter, but it would have been just to be able to step into another uh, 
all time great. Would have been awesome. Ben Law says, uh, after uh, considering or after not making a comeback, do you feel thankful for knowing when to quit? Yeah, I'm happy. I have no regrets at all about uh, retiring when I did. Glenn Wilson, who also saw you in, in uh, Canastota, said, how's the powerlifting going? Last time I saw him, he packed on loads of muscle. Yeah, I saw him about 225. I'm not as muscular, but I'm a little more cut. Uh, but I, I still work in the gym that want to power lift. And, uh, you know, I still push up heavy weight, but nothing in competition or to the extent where I'm injured. I like this from Nick Taylor. He says, uh, Kelly was a massive favorite of mine. Uh, such an entertaining fighter. A couple of questions. Uh, after the Zuniga, Zuniga and Miranda fight and first, first Taylor fight, Kelly was rightly praised for being an all-action fighter. He showed in the Taylor rematch that he was a world-class boxer as well. Did you feel your boxing skills were underrated because of the earlier slugfests you had? Absolutely. And of course, the Hopkins and Martin didn't help. And again, you know, the fight that I was up on, on the scorecards going into the ninth round. But, you know, it is what it is. And I, I don't know if I put all the time and energy into defending that, I would never have anything done. I probably have to be back in the ring fighting again. But, um, no, it, it is. I think I, I definitely was. But, you know, it's, it's fans' opinions, and, and that happens in sports, and, you know, they're going to have it. So, Another fight you were close to, by the way, was Paul Williams, wasn't it? Yeah. So that was a fight that drew – I don't know what happened on that one, but that was Lou Bella and top rank, and, and it just kept falling through. I would have loved that fight. You're talking about a kid coming up who was fighting – was big at welterweight. I mean, he was tall, he was lanky, but Paul Williams, uh, his biggest strong point was being a, a volume puncher. And I think fighting me, who was a volume puncher, same height, you know, but I'm, I'm at 160, I, I think I, he wouldn't have been able to keep up with it. And I just think the hard punches. So Paul Williams is a fantastic fighter, um, but I would have loved to have that fight. Robert Palmer, uh, how close was the Calzaghe fight? It was pretty close. I don't know what happened in the breakdown of that fight. And I know there was a lot after the Gary Lockett fight. Who, well, when you say Gary's a big fan, I seen Gary last year. Gary's a pretty cool dude. Um, I like Gary Lockett. He's doing great. He's still involved in the sport. But um, when I fought him, his dad was a trainer at the time, Enzo. And Jack and Enzo had wars with each other. But I thought for sure that we would end up uh, coming together and fighting. Um, Alexander Fletcher says, do you have regrets? No. I do not. Uh, some of them, I mean, it's not regrets. I guess if, if I could maybe do it again, do it over. Um, I think with the Martinez fight, I think I definitely would have um, came in at a catch weight. And here's the reason. I knew it was my last fight at middleweight anyway. So strip me of the titles. Find me. I don't give a shit. Um, I think coming in at 162. Um, would, have, would have been a world of difference. You're talking about probably a, a 12 hours of, of drying out and, and extra cardio. But then again, I also look at it too. And I say, if I would have came at 162, I would have took a pounding for that, you know, through the media and everybody else. So um, it is what it is. And then the Hopkins fight, maybe postponing. But again, at the time, everything transpired. Take a sorority, a, a the fight was only a couple of weeks out. And, and then the one issue was the day, the day before the fight and the day of the film. you know there was nothing we could do about it but you know again I, at the same time I say I lost to Bernard Hopkins and, and if I go out there and say anything else it just hurts me more um, John Hamilton says uh, basically why retire after four successful comeback fights was that that you wanted to see if the eye of the tiger was still there and the ambition had just gone it was and again the, the, the fight with Andre Ward not happening was the icing on the cake people have to remember so when I retired in Andre Ward, I'm pretty sure I, I, I do know that the Super Six was still going on with the Super Middleweights. Um, there was no real meaningful fight there. It was locked in contact, and I was done being away from home. I was done being that, that far gone. I didn't care to, to fight anymore, and there was no big meaningful fight out there. There really wasn't. So Andre Ward fell through, and I just didn't have, I didn't have the extra oomph to, to go through another training camp and they get pumped up for another fight that wasn't of any real worth. So 
Last two here from Will Buckley, who says, uh, I'm a big fan uh, and it's always great to see fighters from places like Youngstown achieve great things and put their hometowns back on the map. Uh, how important was Youngstown to you, to you during your career and how difficult was it to break into big time boxing from outside the established centers of boxing? So going back, that's the one thing with Youngstown, again, you know, as I said earlier, they're huge. You the fans, the fans support what your fans Young, you know, um, went to the fight in, in Atlantic City, how big that was, a contingency of 6,000 people. Um, you know, it's just huge. And Youngstown, that's his fight town. So um, it, it was a big help. And then the second part of his question is, do you think you might have done better leaving Jack Lowe at an earlier stage for a more established pro, pro trainer? Or do you think it was the right setup for you at the time? I, uh, I don't know. I to be honest with you, um, I think it could have. Who knows? You know, if I never, if I switch the trainer, um, I can't answer that. You know, so. Um, but it, there's a lot of great trainers out there, and, and you know, and it is boxing. I mean, a lot of people work on different things, but you know, me and Jack had a great run. You know, we won a, a world. Uh, it is what it is. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for your time. I'm always grateful to speak to you. It's been great to cover your career. It's been great to speak to you subsequently. And, um, and I'm really grateful for your time. I'll get people to check you out on social media and to check out your podcast. And, um, and thank you so much. I always love asking you the hard questions because you give me all the straight answers. Yeah, I try to as best as I can. If somebody got to hold back on, I'm sorry, but it's all good. I appreciate it. I always have a good time, man. Thank you. Thank you. And I can ask you the hard questions because you can't shoot me with a BB gun through the screen. So I'm good. <laughs> yeah. if, I shoot you, if I get in trouble for a BB gun now, it'll put me away for 40 years. So. <laughs> All right, Kelly. Well, look, thank you so much, man. All the best and keep enjoying retirement. Keep, keep right, doing what you're you, doing. Man. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye. No problem. Man. Do it again.